Okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today, this morning, it's a brief introduction to deep learning, and we will go through uh, many key things for deep learning, like uh, automatic differentiation. And so the purpose today is really to cover the basics of machine learning so that everyone is okay with that. And then we go a little bit to deep learning and then to, uh, to a way to use physics into deep learning techniques. So uh, if you have any question, of course, uh, do not hesitate to interrupt me because it's really the first lecture. So uh, you have really to understand everything from this lecture. Um, we will use uh, here, so I, I put the slides on the Discord. And also we will do some, uh, some exercise on the Python notebook this morning. So uh, I put also the three notebooks on the server. And so we will use uh, Google Collab to run that on your laptop. Uh, so, so why are we talking about deep learning that much? Uh, why is it so popular? It's because uh, it's very efficient for many tasks. And we will see that uh, in the next slide. And there is also something else which is different from machine learning is that it's an end-to-end -end approach, meaning that you take the data and you, you define uh, the task and everything is almost automatic. So that's why we call that end-to-end. -end. And uh, uh, of course, it's not so easy to define architecture or network for that, but we will see uh, this. And it's a really a strong point compared to a, a standard machine learning techniques. And of course, you know that deep learning is very popular now, but why now? Uh, there are many things. Uh, of course, it's related to the hardware uh, performances, like all the GPUs from NVIDIA, uh, almost. Um, it's also related to the size of the data set we can uh, have access to, uh, like uh, ImageNet, which was maybe the first uh, very large data set uh, with millions of images, annotated images. Uh, there are also two things uh, which are really important uh, about the success of deep learning is the, the fact that it's very easy to use. And you will see that uh, through the notebooks, uh, using PyTorch is in fact very easy uh, for any task. Uh, so there are two main libraries now, which are uh, PyTorch uh, from Facebook and Keras TensorFlow from Google. Um, and, and okay, these are the practical things. And also there are some algorithmic advances which are not so new. And we will see that for the automatic differentiation, for instance, but it makes things very easy to do. So that's really the, the purpose today. It's to cover uh, this, uh, uh, which is a brief introduction, of course, of machine learning and deep learning. But the key thing is uh, why is it so uh, uh, efficient and how can I use it uh, in, my, uh, in my application? So just to uh, show you some example where deep learning was really uh, um, efficient compared to previous methods. For instance, uh, these are images from the ImageNet dataset. And the purpose is, is to recognize what is in the images. Uh, so you imagine that you have to annotate all these images. So here, for instance, there is a bird, a frog, a, a child, a dog, and so on and so on. And there, there, there was a, a really big difference between uh, standard machine learning techniques where the error rate, I guess, was about 20 or 15%. And now it's less than five and even less, uh, 5%. So th there was a big gap at, the, at uh, this moment, it was in uh, 2014 and 15. So it's, it's really a, a, a classical uh, application for deep learning, but it's not the only one. Of course, if you think that you are able to uh, recognize the object in an image, you can try to segment an image 
So it's a little bit different. You try to get the boundary of each object and you can do this in real time. So uh, it's, it's really, really nice, for instance, to be able to segment such a natural scene, uh, urban scene, where you can detect cars, roads, and so on. Um, something which is also a, a little bit different, um, uh, it's, a, it's a, an application called image captioning, where the purpose is, uh, the input is an image like that, and uh, the objective of the task is to uh, try to build a sentence describing the image, okay? So here you see that uh, you have to do two things. You have to extract some information from the image and try to build something which makes sense, okay, the sentence. So it's not really an easy task and deep learning was very efficient for this. So these are really image-based application, but these are not the only application, of course. Uh, you may have heard about this uh, in newspapers where uh, people try to um, make um, algorithm to learn how to play Atari games. So here again, you, you have a, an image as an input and the purpose of the task is to find uh, the best move. So for the joystick here, uh, related to the input image, okay, without knowing the rules of the game. Uh, so it's a, it's a different task, of course, uh, but you see that it was at that time very efficient and it's also something that we couldn't imagine with machine learning techniques. Uh, from images, uh, we have all this application. Of course, we can do things on sentences. And uh, something which is really nice now is that, okay, you have Google Translate and DeepL and so on, but you have also this in real time, uh, for instance, in Skype. So it means that you have to uh, get an audio signal, uh, translate it into a sentence, and then translate this sentence into another language. And this can be done in real time uh, using deep learning techniques. The, the real time thing is related to really the performance of the GPUs. And this, is, this was not uh, possible uh, before. And the, the last uh, example here is a text generator. So the purpose is to provide one or two sentences at the beginning. And you ask uh, the algorithm to build a text from these two sentences. And if you look at this, uh, you can check the OpenAI website and the text generator uh, thing, and you can play with it online. It's, it's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> Not amazing, but uh, crazy. Um, okay, so these are some examples of uh, classical, let's say deep learning uh, application for images. And we will try to understand what are the, the fundamental uh, elements of deep learning uh, this morning. But before that, uh, we need to go to machine learning and to be sure that we talk the same language. So uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be a brief introduction to machine learning right now. So everybody uh, will be okay with the vocabulary. Um, and I tried to do this with the iPad. <laughs> okay. I won't write it. So live demo is not, not good. <laughs> um, so basically, in machine learning, uh, what we do uh, is that we have an input. For instance, in the previous example, it was an image. So X, it's called the input. And the output of the task is called Y. Two classical examples in uh, machine learning uh, are regression and classification. So in regression, what you want to do is to fit a function from your data point. Okay, so uh, here is X, you have the value Y, and you want to fit uh, a function uh, for, this, um, for this data set. And this is typically what we will do in the notebook today, okay? 
the other uh, main application uh, in machine learning or key key application it's called classification where you want to separate for instance two data sets okay so you know that these data sets are crosses these are circles and you want to find a boundary between these two groups so you want to separate the two groups okay uh, so this morning we will talk about regression mainly and there is something else we need to know. Uh, uh, there are another um, thing is, uh, do we have a supervised framework or unsupervised? So it's easy to understand this from the classification. So for instance, the supervised, it means that you have the couple XI and YI, okay? So for each sample, you know, for instance, where it is and the class. Okay, if it's a cross or a circle. In an unsupervised case, uh, you, you have just data like that, and you don't know the class okay, or the group. So these are two different things. And this morning, uh, for simplicity, but mainly because for regression, we have this, we will work in a supervised uh, setting. Okay. And once you, you've done that, for instance, you want to uh, uh, fit the curve on this point, so in the regression program, you need to evaluate the, the, the fitting, um, the estimated fitting. And so it's, it's called the performance of your algorithm. So it's P. Uh, we talk about accuracy of the model, error rate or loss. Um, and we want to minimize this. Uh, I just want to mention here that the term model is different from physics. Here, the model is uh, the function we have estimated, F. It's not an equation. It's not a physical model, okay? So it can be sometimes um, confusing. A model in machine learning or deep learning is not really a model in physics. Okay. So uh, I will go through uh, a linear regression example, okay? Just to make sure that everybody is okay. Uh, and we will do that in a, in a notebook. So basically uh, we can consider that uh, the input uh, data are from a, a, a space of dimension N, okay? The output can be any dimension, but in this case, uh, it's in dimension one, okay? It's a scalar value. So the purpose is to uh, estimate a model F, so this function that relates X and Y, okay? So for instance, in the linear regression, we can assume that F is a linear function or a linear model. So basically what we want to do here is this, we have some data points, okay? And we want to fit the best line through the data points. Something that we have to, uh, to, to know also is that uh, how do we call uh, the parameters of this function? So sometimes we, call, we use the, the term parameters and sometimes we use the term weights, but these are exactly the same. So basically here in this example in 2D, uh, what we want to estimate is something like this. So Y is equal to AX plus B. B is called the bias, and we want to estimate A and B. So we have only two parameters, okay? Two weights to estimate. So the purpose in machine learning and in deep learning, and, and this is what we will do this morning, it's to estimate these parameters, so usually we can call that W for the weights, such that the estimation is very close to the real point, okay? So it means that F of X is very close to the true data point Y, okay? Um, something that we also use, it's, a, it's another term that maybe it's different from physics, uh, when we uh, apply a model, a network, to some data X, we call that a prediction. So in the netbook, 
uh, you will see this. We call that Y prediction, Y pred. Okay. Um, and so now we have to uh, understand how we can evaluate the performance of the, the model, the estimated uh, function. For this, of course, you can do something which is very, very simple. It's called the mean square error. Okay. You compute the distance between the prediction okay, and the real data. Okay, so what it is for a given xi, it means that you compute distance between the prediction and the real data. Okay. Uh, and basically what we do to estimate the weights or the parameters of the model is to minimize the mean square error. To minimize the mean square error, uh, a basic thing is that things sorry is to um, compute the gradient of this function MST, okay, which is a function of the weights. So we, we derive the MSE with respect to the weights W, and of course we want this equal to zero. So at the end we are able to estimate uh, W. Uh, using this this kind of approach, of course, in this case of the linear uh, linear regression, you have the analy analytical solution. Okay. Um, so the question now, okay, we have some data related to to this. We have estimated uh, the, the 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 model, which is here uh, just a linear function. And the question is, uh, okay, if I have uh, some, let me see. If I have some new data points, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> if we have some new data points like this, it's not blue, uh, is it correct? Uh, what what what's the, the 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 relevance of the model? Okay, so the question is: Okay, I have estimated a function given some data points, and if I have new data points, does it does it does it feel okay uh, with this this uh, estimated model, or should we uh, fit something else? So the problem here is: um, What is uh, the the, the performance of the estimate, estimated model on unseen data. That's called uh, the generalization problem, okay? So basically, uh, we fit, of course, we estimate uh, the parameters of your model on some training data. So that's a vocabulary also dedicated to machine learning. So you use the crosses, for instance, to train the model, to estimate the parameters. And we want to know uh, what happens when we have unseen data. So for instance, the steer curve here, okay? So of course, uh, when we estimate the parameters, because we minimize uh, the mean square error, for instance, the training error, which is the mean square error, should be very low, okay? So we have this term, the training error, which should be very low. And the question is, is the test error is also low? So the test error is the same as the generalization error. It means that when you have unseen test data, so the steer curls here, uh, what is the error I do? So uh, you minimize the training error and you want to uh, evaluate the performance on your model of your model on the test error, the generalization error. Um, here, for instance, we have only considered a linear um, function, okay? Uh, the problem is what kind of function should I use? For instance, imagine that you have uh, such a data, okay? These are almost the same uh, picture. Uh, in this case, for instance, if I fit a linear model, of course, you can see that it's not really uh, relevant since you, you have something which is 
almost non-linear in your data. Okay. Uh, so you are not happy with that. Um, maybe if you use like a, a polynomial or second order polynomial, it's better. In this case, for instance, you have a, a separable. And uh, if you apply a high order polynomial, this is maybe what you can get. Okay. So the question here is, um, what is the complexity of the function should I use? Okay. Uh, and and it, of course, there is no answer to this, uh, almost, no theoretical answer. Uh, if, for instance, you use a linear model in such a case, we can say that you are underfitting, in the case of underfitting uh, your data. If you, uh, if you uh, use a too, too complex model, it's called overfitting, meaning that maybe, for instance, this cross is just noise. And so you try to fit everything and you try to fit the noise, basically. And of course, in this case, maybe uh, the, best, the best function is a second order polynomial. And of course, it doesn't fit well on this data, but these data are maybe noise, okay? So that's the question and uh, we will see that. Um, how can we define the function uh, how can we parameterize the function f? Um, so as I said, there is no uh, theoretical answer to say, okay, I should exactly uh, such the function to estimate my, to fit my data. So what we do usually is um, here, uh, it's the, the complexity of your model, okay, called the capacity. And here uh, I represent the error rate. So basically when you do the, the training, the error uh, will decrease as the model is more complex. So for instance, think about this. Here in the, this case, the training error is high and here it's very low. So it's a very basic model, it's a more complex one. So the training error will decrease. But of course, if you apply this on the unseen data, so the test data, maybe the error will increase, okay? And so a way, an experimental way to uh, decide which model sh I should use is to, to, um, to look at these two curves, okay? The training error and the generalization error. Of course, we want the training error to, to decrease, but we, want, we don't want that the generalization error will increase. Okay. Um, okay. So it's a very, very brief introduction about what we do usually uh, in machine learning. Uh, for those who are not uh, maybe, um, let's say not uh, expert, but not uh, very, uh, familiar with this field, is there any question about all the vocabulary? Because there are many terms, maybe new terms online or it's, it's fine for everyone. Okay. Um, okay, just one thing uh, about machine learning that we won't do this morning um, because we will be a bit lazy uh to draw this kind of picture what we need is to uh split the data set into three uh data sets the first is called the training set so this is the data points that you will use to fit uh, your uh, your your model f uh, in this case uh, we don't know for instance uh, the order of the polynomial so we can choose the best order using a validation set, okay, which is another data set. And finally, to estimate the performance of your algorithm, you use unseen data, which is called the test set. So this morning, we will only use uh, training sets and you, you will understand why. Uh, it's, it's related to, uh, to, uh, to the physics and because we know the, the ground truth, uh, we are not really interested in this, but of course we can. 
Ok. Top. Uh, so to sum up, uh, these are really uh, the, the vocabulary we will use. Uh, X is the input, Y is the output. Today, we will work mainly on the regression and in the supervised case, meaning that we have uh, some data and some input data and output. Okay, so basically here, uh, we will work on physics uh, application. So it means that, for instance, X can be a special domain, okay, like here, and Y can be a um, uh, quantity of interest, any kind of quantity like uh, velocities or uh, any kind of things. Uh, and we will look, of course, at the accuracy of the model because we will have some physical, um, physical equation. Okay, uh, so these are all the things we have seen. So now, uh, if everything is okay for you uh, for machine learning, we will talk a little bit about neural networks. So basically deep learning. Uh, what are the key things in deep learning? So here, once again, uh, you have to keep in mind that what we want to do is to estimate a function, okay? This function f that relates uh, x to y. And the parameters to learn, okay, in this case, they are called theta. So we want to approximate a function. Basically, deep learning is this, okay? It's an approximation problem. What is interesting is that neural networks are in fact a, a specific parameterization of f, f is not any kind of function like a polynomial or whatever. It's a composition of basic function. So for instance, you apply a function f1 and then a function f2 and then the function fn. So in this case, you have n functions and this is related to the number of layers you will have in your network. Okay, so this is really important. And if we don't have that, we can't really apply uh, deep learning techniques. So once again, uh, when we want to estimate the parameters, because this is the purpose of deep learning, we want to estimate the parameters such that we minimize this function, okay? So this is the prediction. So you have your input data, you have your model, your network, you predict some data and you compare with the true, uh, true data yi. So here, for instance, it's a, it's a common way to draw a, a network. So you have the input, okay? You have the output, and we have intermediate variables, H here, H1, 2, 3. Uh, if you are not familiar with this, it's not so easy to uh, see what are the composition of the two functions, or even more, uh, that we are applying here. So this is a way to draw a network, and this is the equation of the function f, okay? So if we look at this, what we do, okay, we have, we, we start from the, the outside, okay? Here it's a uh, intermediate variable h. Y, uh, y is given by the multiplication of h1 w1 plus h2 w2 plus h3 w3 which is this formula and something which is not in the picture is that we apply a nonlinear function in this case we call that sigma so basically what we do here is that this is a vector and we apply a matrix uh, to this vector to get y so this is it and you can do the same for h Okay, so these values are obtained using exactly the same thing. So you have the input vector xi, you multiply by this matrix, you apply a nonlinear function, and you have again this. So when you have this kind of pictures, which is called a multiple layer perceptron or something like this, um, fully connected layers or whatever, basically the function you want to, uh, to estimate is this one. Okay, 
and the parameters are the W. Okay. So it's really a way to parameterize the function you want to estimate. So how we do this, uh, how we do we do deep learning? Basically, uh, you define the function. So it's the number of layers. It's in fact, the number of functions you want to, to, to use. Okay. You have your input data. You can compute a prediction. Okay. So this is exactly the, the previous slide. You compare the prediction to the target. Okay, and you define a loss. And using this loss, you will try to modify the parameters such that the loss will decrease. Okay, so there are three steps in deep learning, in any deep learning techniques, and all the, these three steps are very important. Okay, so for instance, uh, next week with Luca and Serge, they will talk mainly on optimization. And you, you can see that optimization, you will see that in the net, notebook, that may be, may be very, very tricky. So when you want to apply, uh, when you want to build a, a, a deep learning algorithm, you really need to do all these three uh, steps. Okay, What kind of function uh, I want to, to model? Uh, what can be the best loss for my application? And uh, how do I update? What, which kind of optimization technique should I use? So basically, uh, you will see that in the in few minutes in the Python notebook. If I take this uh, this function, okay, this network, this is how we do in PyTorch. Okay, we need to uh, to import some stuff. Uh, basically, a network is a class in Python, okay? And what we do is need, we need to define the function we will apply. So here in this case, the first layer, it's the metric multiplication between the vector X and this matrix, okay? And it's a linear operation. So in Python, it's called linear, okay? The input size is four, X, one, two, three, four. And the output size is three. H123. Okay. So we define this matrix this way. So it's called linear. We do we have to do the same here. So uh, the input size is three and the output is one. So once again, uh, another layer. And when we want to do the prediction, we have to define this function called forward, where we apply first the first uh, linear operation. We apply a nonlinear operation here. We'll see that later on. Then the second layer, and then another nonlinear uh, activation. And then you have your prediction. Okay. So this network is related to this class. We say that we the second step is to define the, the loss. So in this case, it's a MSC loss, as we've seen uh, previously. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the optimization since uh, you will have this uh, next week. So you, you need to define an optimization. And then here is the iteration loop where you want to optimize your parameter. So basically you compute your prediction, you estimate, you compute the loss function, and here you apply uh, the optimization algorithm and that's it. And so we will do that uh, this morning on many, many things like basic regression, but also physical problems. So if you, if you get this, uh, you will be okay uh, for, I guess, many, many applications in deep learning. Just a question about why should we uh, use neural network? Uh, there is a, a, a theorem called the universal approximation theorem, uh, which is nicely illustrated here. So you have this function you want to, uh, to approximate, okay, the, the black uh, curve. And uh, what you can see is that with a simple network like that, so here it's a linear, um, linear operation followed by a nonlinear uh, uh, function, okay? It's simply this. 
uh, you are able to approximate this kind of function. Basically, what this theorem says is that you can approximate any kind of function with this very simple architecture, very simple network. If you can increase, for instance, the, num the number of neurons, the number of units you have here, okay? So you can see here that, for instance, if you use only six neurons or six units, it does not fit correctly the, the data. If you increase, of course, the number of neurons, it's, it's better. And it, it's, uh, it's uh, almost correct for every, everywhere, or all the data points. Uh, and of course, if you increase again and again the number of neurons, it will fit the data. So it's it's really a, a key aspect in deep learning, since the 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 thing is that we can approximate almost any kind of function with neural networks. And of course, the problem here that we is not mentioned is okay. There is this uh, theoretical um, thing which tell me that uh, I can approximate any kind of function, but can I, well, can I correctly learn all the, the, the parameters uh, of this function? This is another problem. So once again, it's the, the lecture next week, but it's not, it's not provided in this theorem. It does not say that you can learn the weights. Uh, okay. So uh, just a brief uh, introduction to uh, the way we update uh, the, the weights because we will use that in the notebook today. So very briefly, uh, what we do is that we have a loss, for instance, J, uh, which, is, um, which, which you want to minimize. And what you do is a gradient distance. So you compute the gradient of this. We, we want this to be equal to zero. So we update the parameters very brief, very simply, such that the new parameters is the old one minus something for the learning rate multiplied by the, the gradient of J with respect to the parameters. Okay. You will have to, to, to write this kind of thing um, in a notebook. One, one question online. How do we know the number of layer and the number of neurons to use in the model? Uh, we don't basically uh, so so uh, the it's related to the generalization problem uh, we've seen so far or previously sorry uh, if you remember the curve uh, here on the, the right the bottom right uh, we try to find the number of layers and the number of neurons uh, using uh, experimental uh, settings there is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, theoretical uh, result on that, except that we are able to, uh, to approximate the function. Uh, okay. So just a, a quick example of something that you can do very easily uh, when you want to understand what's going on in a network. So here it's... Um, the TensorFlow playground. So you can uh, play uh, basically with a network. Uh, here it's a classification problem. So you want to uh, classify the orange dot uh, with, res with respect to the blue dots, and you want to separate the two groups. Okay. And basically, uh, x1 and x2 are just the coordinates. Okay. And what we want to do here is, uh, well, with this simple uh, network, we want to classify uh, this, uh, these, two, these two groups. So basically here, what we have, it's a very simple uh, network. We have two layers, okay? Four neurons and two neurons. And you can see at the end that you are able to classify such a kind of data. Of course, you are not able to classify this data using a linear approach. A linear approach means that you want to, to separate the two groups with a, with a line. And you can see that with very few parameters, you are able to 
learn a very nice uh, boundary decision. A question that is uh, usually, uh, well, uh, we don't have a clear answer about what to do is what kind of nonlinear function should we introduce in our network? So basically here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very smooth uh, function. And if we use a ReLU, which is a, a very, uh, very basic function, it's, uh, if it's negative, it's zero, and otherwise it's the same value. So it's, uh, it's really simple. You apply this instead of, uh, instead of a smooth function, and this is the boundary that you get at the end. So basically, the uh, activation function, the nonlinear function that you use in your network may have an impact on the shape of the boundary. And this is typically uh, something that you can see using this kind of activation function, the ReLU. Uh, and you, you will see that also in the regression. It's exactly the same. It's a piecewise linear function that you estimate. Another question. Uh, why not? <laughs> so the question is, did you, or do you recommend some grid search technique to find good hyperparameters of a model? And basically this is what we do usually. Uh, we try many parameters and try to find the best one, even the data set. So grid search is maybe uh, long to do with deep learning, but... Uh, that may be the good time to speak about the uh, training, validation, and test data set. I talked or, about it. Yeah, this. But maybe as a reminder. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to find the hyper, so you have some parameters to estimate in your network. The hyper parameters in this case is the number of layers or the number of neurons. And you don't know exactly uh, how many neurons or how many layers you should use. Okay, what, what happens if I increase, for instance, the number of layers or the number of neurons? Um, so the, the thing is that uh, to, you have the training data set where you want to minimize uh, your uh, loss function to get your parameters. So this is what you do here. You have your validation data set where you modify your uh, architecture, so the number of layers, the number of neurons, to find the best hyperparameters, so the best number of layers and the best number of neurons. And then you have the test data set where you compute really the, the performance of your algorithm on unseen data. And so, for instance, here you can see that if you increase the number of layers and the number of neurons, basically the decision the boundary is, exact, is almost the same. So it has no impact on that. Uh, TensorFlow Playground is really nice just to uh, have a look at specific, um, specific problems like that. For instance, this is another classification problem. So you have two spirals, uh, one orange and one blue, and you try to uh, separate the two. Okay, so using exactly the same uh, network, you can see what can be the result. And for instance, even in a very simple 2D classification problem, it can be very difficult to estimate your function f. So for instance, you can play with the spirals on the TensorFlow playground, and you, you try to find the, the, the best parameters uh, for that. It's, it's not so easy. Okay, so now we can move to the uh, to the notebooks. So you can open that on Google Collab. So for instance, this is the first notebook uh, we will look at. So the, the, the notebooks are on uh, the Discord server and in on GitHub, I guess. So you can download the, the notebook and import that in Google Collab. Okay. 
Okay, so the first notebook is very uh, easy. We will try to do some regression uh, on 2D regression. Enfin, on 2D, it's, it's a 2D example, sorry. Uh, so basically, uh, all the first uh, things we do is to import the good modules of PyTorch and uh, Matplotlib and so on to display the result. Okay. Uh, and and the, the first example is for linear regression. Okay, so it's very basic. The model, well, the true model, it's y, it's equal to 2 plus 0.5 times x. Okay. So if you run your, uh, your uh, notebook, you should obtain this. So the true model, the true things we want to estimate, uh, it's the red, red uh, line. And the data sets, uh, the data set we have uh, consists in the, the blue dots. Okay, so it's a noisy data set. So in this case, the next step is to define uh, the, the neural network. So here basically is just a linear layer because it's a linear function. So there is no nonlinear function in this network. So you define uh, one layer, one linear layer, okay? And in the forward function, you just apply that. Okay, so it's a very basic uh, network, but it's the beginning. So uh, in the next cell, what you do is you create your network. So it's called linear regression model. Okay. Uh, so basically we have only uh, two parameters. Okay, the slope of the, the line and the bias. Okay, so you have two, two parameters to estimate. Uh, as said previously, here we will use the mean squared error to, uh, to estimate the, the parameters. So you just need to define uh, this. So we, we, we put criter criterion, it's equal to the MSC loss. Okay, the MSC is just the sum of the square difference. Well, the mean of the square difference. Uh, and then we use a, a specific uh, optimizer. So here it's called SGD, is stochastic gradient descent. But we, we won't care that, about that uh, today. As you can see, the loop to estimate uh, your uh, parameters is not very complicated. Basically, here we do uh, like 1,000 iteration. And in deep learning, we call that epochs. So uh, 1,000 iteration where first you do the prediction, okay? So you apply your model on your data. So that's called the, the forward function in your uh, network on X. Then you compute uh, the loss function, okay? Between the prediction, so Y pred and Y, which is the, the true, uh, True data, and uh, the last three things are related to uh, the update of the parameters. We won't uh, look at this that much. So if you run that on Google Colab, this is something uh, you can get. So the the green uh, line, uh, the green lines are the estimated uh, model at each epoch. Okay, so you can see that at the beginning, uh, it's completely, uh, it's completely um, incorrect, but at the end, uh, it's, it's going through uh, all the iteration and you are close to the, to the red line. Um, okay, so visually you can have a look at this and you can see how it, how it goes and how it fits the, the data. Of course, when we do deep learning, we want to check the evolution of the loss function. So this is the next 
next, uh, this is the next uh, cell where we just plot the value of the MSE uh, with respect to uh, the iterations. Okay, and it's decreasing. Okay, it's nice. And then we can, of course, get the estimated parameters. Okay. So that's that's very simple. And you see that uh, what we've done is first you define an architecture, you define a neural network, then you specify a loss function, the MST in this case, and you define an optimizer, an optimizer. And then you apply the training uh, steps. Okay, so now we want to do the same for a nonlinear regression. Okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, this equation, y is equal to 2 plus 0.5x, and we add a term, minus 0.05x uh, squared. Okay, so you have, of course, a nonlinear function to estimate here. And if you apply just your previous uh, linear model, it, it won't work, of course. So what we do here, uh, we apply um, uh, a nonlinear function in your network. So first a linear layer, then a nonlinear uh, activation, and then a linear layer. So this is what is done. What what is done? Yes, in the nonlinear regression neural network class. Okay, and when you look at the forward method, you apply first the linear layer a nonlinear activation function and a linear layer again, okay? The steps after that are the same. You define a criterion, so the loss function, you define an optimizer, and you do the same for uh, the training steps. It's a loop over the number of iteration. And you can see here that the number of iterations is much bigger than before, is uh, 20,000 iterations. Once again, of course, we look at the loss function and we look at the output. Here, uh, so the output, the estimated function is in green, okay? So if you look closely to this, as in the previous example in TensorFlow Playground, the green function that we have estimated is a piecewise linear function, okay? It's not a smooth function. Okay. So now the question we have, it's how does it work for uh, the network uh, where you don't have data during your training step? So that's the question uh, I put on the notebook. So what is the generalization performance of the network? So take a few minutes to apply the network on unseen data. So you just build some data, okay, outside the, the range of the training uh, range. And you apply your network and look at the results. It could be that easily. So what I want to do here is to create a report. 
If you have any question online, do not hesitate. Um, I can hear you, but um, if you can put questions on the chat, it's fine. What you have estimated is the green one, which means that, uh, as we've seen before, uh, using this kind of activation function, uh, the ReLU, we have a, a, a piecewise linear estimation. So, of course, outside the interval, for instance, from 30 to 50, we do not have any training data set. Okay. So, definitely, what's going on is that it's just uh, an extrapolation of this piecewise linear uh, function. Okay. So what 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 we can uh, conclude on that is that when you do regression in deep learning on whatever, you are doing interpolation. Okay. You are not able to extrapolate to do some extrapolation on unseen data. And of course, here. Uh, well, there is a discrepancy between the, the green model, the green estimated model, and the true model, the red one. Okay. So it's it's of course it's it's uh, it's the idea uh, because we don't have any training data set, so of course the the, the fit uh, cannot be good. Okay, but you will have this in many complex uh, application where you 
cannot really look at the data. Okay, for instance, if you if you imagine that X is an image, what is the distribution of an image? What does it mean to be out of the distribution? What is a new image? Okay. So this is basically the thing that we, we, we need to, to, to be careful about. It's when you do uh, your experiments, you really need to do some, what we call cross validation, which means that we try to validate what we have learned, the model we have estimated several times on unseen data, okay? So this is a very simple uh, example uh, about nonlinear regression, but once again, many problem we have in deep learning, it's only regression, okay? Um, okay, so, so that's why that was really the first uh, part of this uh, lecture. Uh, we will continue. Um, so now we have we have seen the machine learning vocabulary. We have seen some basic stuff about neural networks and how it uh, how it, you can implement that in PyTorch. Now uh, uh, we would like to go through the one of the key concepts uh, for neural network and deep learning. It's called automatic differentiation. Okay. So what is automatic differentiation? You've seen that uh, basically when you want to estimate the parameters of your model, what you do is a gradient descent. So it means that you are able to compute the gradient of your loss function with respect to the parameters of your model. Okay, so the question is, how can we compute the gradient? And usually the thing that, that comes in mind is uh, okay, I, I can use a finite difference method. But in this case, uh, if you look at just the, the, the equation of what is the derivative, what is the gradient, the question is, okay, I have this, which is the limit when H uh, goes to zero, but in practice, what can be the good value for H, okay? If it's too large, uh, you, may, you may do some truncation error. If it's too small, it can be unstable. So definitely a uh, finite difference method is not, uh, it should be avoided in, in our case. And what we will uh, see is that uh, the way we can compute the gradient in, in neural networks using automated differentiation, it's, it's very flexible. And you can apply this to many, many other problems other than in deep learning framework. So for instance, uh, imagine that you have this function. Okay, so the, your inputs are in, in dimension two. So you have x1, x2, and the output is a scalar value y. Okay, so you have this function. So first, the question is, how can I compute the value of y for given x1, f, and x2, okay? So to do this, uh, we will use uh, variables v, okay? And we say that x1 is equal to v minus one and x2 is equal to v zero, okay? So when you look at this uh, function, you can say, okay, maybe the first uh, thing I want to compute is x1 over x2. You have these three times in the equation. So maybe it's a good start. <laughs> So we can create a new variable, v1, which is x1 over x2, which is in fact v minus one over v0, okay? And you can compute easily v1, the value of v1. Of course, we will have to do this. Uh, the next step can be to compute this, the, the sign of this. Uh, and then we will have to compute the exponential of x2 and so on and so on, okay? So we can do this, it's not very complicated, of course. And we have variables called v1 to v6. And at the end, y is equal to v6. 
Okay. So this is the way you can compute the value of a function. It's very important to understand that uh, you need all these steps. And all these steps, it's called a trace. And you have some, that sometimes in a PyTorch or TensorFlow. So this is the evaluation trace. So these are all the operation you do to compute the value of y at the end, okay? And you keep all the, the intermediate values, okay? So it's not very complicated, of course. And now we will use this kind of approach to compute the derivative of y. So what is interesting to see is that this trace can be put as a graph and we call that a computational graph. So you have x1, x2, okay? The two by input variables and the output is y, so v6. And you can see that for instance, to compute v1, we needed x1 and x2. So v1 was x1 over x2, okay? So we, we, we put these two arrows from v0 and v minus one to v1. And you do this, uh, until you, you reach y, so v6. So the computational graph is really, really important. And it's uh, something that is, um, is, uh, is created uh, by PyTorch when you want to compute the, the, the gradient. So, okay, there are two ways to compute the derivative of y with respect to the inputs. So first we will see the forward mode, okay? So we want to differentiate the output y with respect to one of the input. So in this case, x1. Okay. We introduced a new notation, okay? So it's v dot i. So it's the partial derivative of vi with respect to x1. That's just a notation. So reminder, we have this, x1 is equal to v minus one, x2 is equal to v0, and v1 is equal to v minus one uh, over v0. Okay, so I want first to compute the derivative of v1 with respect to x1. So this is it, okay. I apply the definition of partial derivatives Okay, so V1 depends on V0 and V minus one. So basically you have this equation. Okay. And when you look at this, the second terms are the definition of V dot I. So here is V dot minus one and here it's V dot zero. So you, you get this. And then for instance, uh, V1, so V1, is V minus one over V zero. And when you compute the derivative with respect to V minus one, of course, you get one over V zero. Okay, there is no trick here, it's very simple. And you do the same here. Okay, so basically what you do here is that you split the way you compute the derivative. Okay. And it's called forward mode because we will compute the derivative for each of the V, so V1, V2, V3, four, five, six. So at the end, we will have V dot six, which is the derivative of V6, which is Y, the output, with respect to one of your inputs, okay? So if we look at this, so for instance, if you compute the derivative of V, uh, minus one, okay, so it's the derivative of x1 with respect to x1, so it's one. If you compute the der derivative of v0, it's going to be zero because it does not depend on x1, of course. This, we've done that, how we can compute this, okay? And you perform this for all the v's. Okay, so V2 is sine of V1. So when you compute the derivative, it's the derivative of this with respect to X1. And you have this, basically it's just the derivative with respect to V1, okay. 
Uh, and you do this again and again and again. So at the end, because you have split, split your, your, uh, the way you compute Y into very simple operation, you are able to compute each derivative. Okay, and at the end, you have the derivative of Y with respect to X1, and you have the value exactly. Okay. So it's related to the what is called the chain rules. And it's very simple. Okay. So what you need to understand here is that if we split even a complex <laughs> function like that in many simple functions, we are able to compute the derivative of the output y with respect to the input. Okay. So that's why basically in neural networks, we consider a neural network as a composition, a combination of simple function. And we will do the same basically to compute the gradient in our network. Okay. One note, one remark is that we've done all these computations for just one value, which is the derivative of y with respect to x1, just one input. Of course, we need to do the same for the second input, x2. So we have to do exactly the same steps to compute the derivative of y with respect to x2. Okay. So that's the forward mode. So it's very natural, it's very simple. And what you have to understand, you, you want to propagate the, the gradient from the input to the output. Of course, you can do the opposite. So it's called the reverse mode. And in this case, you can understand it as compute the sensitivity of the output variable with respect to each intermediate variable, so the previous one. So here, instead of compute the derivative with respect to the input, we compute the derivative of y with respect to previous variables. Okay, and we, we note that V bar. So V bar, the uh, I is just the derivative of Y over uh, the derivative of uh, the derivative of Y with respect to V I. So basically what we will do is we start from the output and try to compute the derivative in backward mode. So to propagate from the output to the input. Also, yes. there's a question online. All right, so the question is, in this case, it seems that an infinitely differentiable function like a soft plus is required to satisfy smoothness in a real dynamic fluidic system. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. <laughs> So it means that I, I don't get why you need different, infinitely differentiable function. Not sure. M maybe we can talk about this at the break. No, but uh, definitely the, the idea is that you can compute the derivative of each uh, basic function. So you can compute again and again and again and again. So that's that's not a, not not an issue. Okay. Um, so if we look at this, so of, of course v six bar is the derivative of y with respect of y. So yeah, so it's one. V six is y. Uh, if you look at v five bar. It's the derivative of y with respect to v5. And again, if you look at this, v5 has only an impact on v6. So that's why you can write the derivative of y with respect to v6 times the derivative of v6 with respect to v5. This is the definition. 
of V6 bar. And if you look at v, V6, V6 is V5 times V4. So if you compute the derivative with respect to V5, it's V4. Okay. So it's very easy uh, again. There is, I put just this uh, for V4 bar because it's a little bit uh, different. The story is a little bit different. You can see that V4 has an impact on V5 and V6. Okay, so when you want to compute this value, you need to do this with respect to V6 and V5. Okay, V4 has an impact on V5 and V6. It's the chain rule again, but in a different way. And it, again, you can compute that easily. So what you need to do in this case, uh, you've seen that here, to compute the derivatives v6 bar, v5 bar, I need the value here, v5, v6. So what you need to do in the reverse mode, it's first you compute the evaluation trace, okay? And then you will go back in the graph. So you can compute v6 bar, of course, which is one, v5 bar, you can compute the value, the, the, the equation is simple, and you go back this way, okay? So basically, that's why it's called the, the backward mode or the reverse mode. So you need to go through the entire graph and then to compute the derivative. In the forward mode, you can do both at the same time, okay? And at the end, you have the derivative of y with respect to x1, which is almost the same value, and x2. So that's a very important thing is that using this kind of approach, you are able to compute the derivative of y with respect to the two inputs. But you need to keep the computational graph. You need all this information to go back. OK, so it's really important to have this in mind because PyTorch and TensorFlow do this for you, okay? So when you build a very large network, this is what is stored, the, 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 the PyTorch will store this kind of graph for you, okay? So that's why it's really, uh, it's really nice to play with neural networks because you put very simple uh, blocks everywhere. And because of this, you are able to compute the gradient very easily. Okay. So maybe just before a break and a notebook on that, a quick remark about automatic differentiation in the Jacobian matrix. So if you consider a function, okay, you have an input vector of size n, okay? And you have uh, output values in the dimension M, okay? So the, the, the dimension of the input uh, space is N and the output space is M. Okay, so this is the function. The Jacobian matrix is this. It's all the partial derivatives. So one row is the partial derivative of one component of F with respect to all the inputs, okay? If you look at the, the matrix like that. If you look at the column, it's the derivative with respect to one input of all the components of F, the value of F, okay? Basically, what we have is that the forward pass, the forward mode, you are able to compute one column. In our example, we computed the derivative of y with respect to x1, and we had to do the same for x2. So it's another computation. So you have to keep in mind that the forward pass is the computation of one column of this matrix. And the reverse pass, the reverse mode, is a computation of a row of this matrix. So if we see that in the previous example, we are able to compute 
the derivative of y with respect to the two inputs x1 and x2. Okay? So these are the two methods to compute derivative easily. So a question in which one should we use in machine learning and why? Do you have any idea? If, if we want to compute the full Jacobian matrix, it's almost the same. Okay, you will have to compute all the columns or all the rows. But if you want to apply this in machine learning, what is a typical setting in machine learning? In machine learning, we may have a large input space. So N can be very, very large. Imagine an image, any kind of data, okay? It can be very large. But the output is usually just the loss. So it's a scalar value. So M is equal to one, okay? So if M is equal to one, it means that you have only one row in your matrix. You want to compute just one row. So in machine learning, because M is equal to one and N can be very, very large, we always use the reverse mode. When you use the reverse mode, you are computing one row and it's fine. So you are able to compute the derivative of your gradient in just one step one application of the reverse pass, okay? Okay, maybe we need the break and we will do uh, the lab session about this just after the break. So it's 11, this. I'll do my flesh. Okay. Uh, so the, the, there was a question during the break regarding this and how we uh, apply this to deep learning and to machine learning. And in fact, uh, the thing is uh, definitely that the function we want to differentiate in uh, machine learning is the loss function and the inputs x1 to xn are the parameters of your network, okay? And basically, this is called backpropagation, okay? So backpropagation, you may have heard about this. It's uh, the way to apply the reverse mode on the loss function. So you compute the gradient of your loss function with respect to the model parameters uh, using a reverse mode. Uh, and basically, this is it uh, in the, the bottom of the slide, you, are, uh, you want to compute the derivative of your loss with respect to some uh, model parameters. Uh, I won't go too much into detail uh, on that. Uh, it's, I guess it's better to spend some time on the notebook. Uh, so basically, um, using almost the same network on the right, okay? Uh, the loss function is the, the mean square error, okay? It's a very, uh, well, it's not the mean square, but it's uh, very similar. Uh, there is a, just a, a notation here. So we look at f of xk, so it's the prediction. And we will call the output, the nonlinear activation of a certain value. So this is equal to yk, but we put here the nonlinear activation outside. And the purpose here is to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to all the weights. So for instance, if we want to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to these weights, which are the weights of the second layer, okay? Second linear layer. Using the chain rule, uh, it's the same. So it's the derivative of the loss with respect to this variable, okay? I just previously defined. Times the derivative of this variable with respect to uh, the parameters W, J, K. 
uh, for the first red term, we put that, we call that delta K, okay? And the second term is very easy to compute. Of course, uh, the matter here is just the sum here of W J K times H J. And you want to derive this with respect to one of the, the parameter. So it's just H J, okay? If you want to do the same for the first layer here, same trick, okay? And here, the red is a, a little bit complicated, so we put that at delta J. Here, the, uh, the, uh, in the second term, the blue term, is almost the same. It's like the, the first one. It's a linear uh, layer. So once again, the derivative is very easy to compute. Okay. And if you want to go a little bit deeper in the way you compute the red term, it's not so difficult. It's just this. So you need to compute the derivative of the nonlinear function, okay, here, and that's it. Okay. So I won't go too much into detail on that, but basically, if you understood the reverse mode, it's back propagation. It's the reverse mode on the loss function. Okay. Uh, what is interesting to note is that, of course, when you compute the gradient of your loss. It depends on the input data. So data, in this case, it's the, are the parameters of the model. And uh, okay, there are some scaling error uh, with respect to the output. So uh, this is a balance between the input and the output, the error between the prediction and the, and the, the true value. Uh, so. Now we'll, again, when we, we stay in the supervised learning setting, and uh, I invite you to open the, the notebook called automatic differentiation, where we will do some automatic differentiation on a very simple function and to compute the gradient of the loss function. So this is the second one. Uh, so you can open that on Google Collab once again, if you don't want to install any uh, Python stuff on your machine. Uh, so basically the first cell is to import some modules, PyTorch and so on. It's not very uh, complicated. The second cell, we define the function F, which is the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, no com not very complicated. And uh, we know the true derivative of this, which is given by one minus the tangent squared. Okay. So we have the ground truth here, the derivative. And we want to compare this ground truth with the automatic differentiation approach. So first we generate some data X so between minus five and five, there is something which is important here as an option by torch is requires grad equal to true because it means that we will use that to compute the gradient. It's important to set that in PyTorch. You will see that in PyTorch Lightning, they do that for you, but in PyTorch, you need to do this. It's a way to say to PyTorch that um, you will use X to compute the computational graph. Okay. So you just apply F to X, this is the second line, and we have the uh, true derivative, which is called F prime of X. Okay. So this is uh, the ground truth. And we want to. Uh, apply the automatic differentiation technique. So x is a vector, f of x is also a vector. Okay. We've seen that if you want to apply the reverse mode, the most efficient thing is to use a scalar value for y, the output. The loss function is usually the scalar value, it's in 1D. So what we do here 
is that we call y is the sum of all the value of f of x. It's a trick because when you will apply the gradients of this with respect to all your input value, in fact, because it's the sum, if you want to compute the gradient with respect to the first value, it's in fact the gradient of the first term of the sum. All the rest is zero, okay? So the way we do uh, things is that we transform this vector f of x into a scalar value by applying the sum. And then you just have to call a specific function in torch, in PyTorch, which is called grad in the autograd module. And if you look at this function here, okay, what you say is that I would like you to compute the gradient of y, so the first variable here, with respect to x. And to do this, you need to create the computational graph. Okay, so these are the three variables in your function. So you want to compute the gradient of y with respect to x, and you did the computational graph. Uh, okay. So if you look at this, we have the tangent, the hyperbolic tangent in blue. Okay. The true uh, value is plot here in red, the analytical uh, formulation, uh, sorry, in green. And the automatic differentiation is in red. So it's almost the same. Okay. So it just means that it works. Cool. Nice. Um, few things about this. Uh, we won't use necessarily. Yeah. Again, yes. But or to say to retain the graph again but we will use that in the next that's why i put that <laughs> another question uh the analytical is exact and the ad solution is uh, is not exactly exact because you have some numerical stuff but uh in this case in this case because it's a very simple approach very simple function yes it is it, it's not exactly the same in the example we've seen just before when the function is more complex and we have combination of function. But in this case, because we have just the uh, one block in the neural network, which is the, the, hyper, the hyperbolic tangent, it's, it should be exactly the same. Yes. In this example. Uh, just a few remarks about the code here. Uh, we say at the beginning uh, x, so it's a value between minus five and five, and it requires the gradient. And basically here, uh, PyTorch will put that in the GPU. So when you want to go back and to plot this, you see that we use uh, two methods. The first is called detach. So it's detached from the GPU. It's a very technical stuff, but you need to do this. And then uh, we want to convert that to NumPy. So sometimes you will see that you, you will have to do this. Uh, and usually we don't use directly the function grad in autograd module. We can use another one, which is called backward. So I put that in the, in the cell just below. And in fact, when you apply backward, it means that you apply the reverse mode on this variable y. And implicitly, it will provide you, it will put the gradient of y with respect to x in the x variable. So that's why here it's x dot grad if you want to take the gradient. Okay, backward is, a, is almost the same function, but it provides you more things and it's, uh, it's um, I guess it's more implementation details here. So yeah, as you said, the, 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 the red and green are exactly the same in this case. 
it shouldn't it, it won't be the same all time yes a good question in the chat is what is the behavior of uh, auto automatic differentiation for a function like ReLU? ReLU, remember it's zero if the value of x is negative and it's a linear function after that. So it means that what is the derivative at zero? And to me, uh, if I remember well, uh, the, you have to specify the value you want at zero. So in PyTorch, I guess, they, they specify the value. I'm not sure it's exactly the same in terms of flow, but you need to specify uh, it. And basically what is done, it's that um, to compute uh, uh, each derivative like that, you need the, the, the basic derivative of these functions. Okay. So, the, yeah. so for instance, really should be a, a problem uh, when you apply that and if you, if you are exactly on zero. Uh, okay. So this is the way, it's very simple to compute the gradient using PyTorch like that. Uh, so the, the, the things that uh, you will do, uh, we go back to the nonlinear regression problem. Okay. So this is the next step. It's, uh, it's exactly as the same uh, as the previous notebook. Uh, we define again a network. Uh, it's the same, uh, two, two layers. And to do, uh, you have to define uh, the training steps using the autograd function. So basically you can copy and paste everything about the loop uh, over the iterations. And instead of using the backward function here, like we've done in the previous step. So the question is to replace this, the last step with the autograd function, okay? We want to apply directly the gradient to apply a gradient descent on the parameters of the model and to update directly the, the parameters. So it's basically exactly this loop that you have to modify the last three uh, lines using the autograd uh, module.
put the loss here, but the, the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters. Okay. So the second variable is the parameters of your model. And then uh, we want to apply a basic gradient descent. To do this, you need to, to go through all the parameters and you want to apply. So you say, okay, for each parameter, I want to say the new parameter is equal to the parameter minus the learning rate times the gradient value. Okay. So basically here, we write a gradient descent algorithm. Compute the gradient, apply, apply it to uh, update the parameters. Okay. So the, it's definitely like this. You can compute any uh, gradient of a function. Same, the loss function is decreasing. Nice. If we look at the, the final result, we can see here that it's the same thing. Uh, it fits well at the beginning and outside where you have less points, it, it, it's a little bit uh, different. So here, what we've done, it's basically the same as the previous notebook, but we apply the very basic gradient descent technique to estimate the parameters. Okay. It's really important to keep in mind that uh, automatic differentiation is not only for deep learning. Okay. We will use that in a different uh, uh, framework in the next uh, notebook, but definitely it's just a way to compute the gradient of any function with respect to some parameters, to some inputs. Okay. So here in deep learning, it's a way to compute the derivative of the loss and to update the parameters. But we will see that you can apply that also for uh, physical equations. So partial differential equation, so PDEs, where you have to compute derivatives. Okay. Uh, okay, so to, to summarize about supervised learning, uh, when you want to apply deep learning to your data, supervised learning is a, a very good point to start. Okay, uh, you have some data, you know your data, and you know what kind of thing you want to get. So sometimes you, it's, it's not the final goal of your application, but it's a good way to start and to experiment your network. Usually supervised learning is also very stable. And because you know the data, you know what you are exactly doing. Uh, there is something which is really important in machine learning. It's called garbage in, garbage out. It means that if you don't know your data well, and if you have some issues in your data, noise, artifacts, or so on, of course, the output of your estimated model will be uh, garbage, technically. Uh, so it's really important in deep learning because uh, as we said at the beginning, is it's like an end-to-end -end approach, and there is no magical stuff inside. So basically, if you do not take care about your data, your input data, the result won't be good at all. So it's really important to look always at your data and what you expect from that. Uh, and what you what you've seen from this example is that when you apply supervised deep learning, it's just interpolation in this case. When we do regression, okay, it's interpolation. We are not able to do some extrapolation. So you are not able to, to provide a good estimation on unseen data. And maybe uh, we will talk about that in a future uh, lecture, but in this case, uh, we do not use any structure in your data. We just consider points. So it's called MLP, it's multiple layer perceptron or fully connected, fully connected layers. So we just provide a point. We do not provide any structure.
structure with the neighborhood and so on that you can do with convolutional neural network. Okay. Uh, so, so far, we, we have seen all of this, the machine learning vocabulary, uh, what is a neural network, how to apply automatic differentiation. And now, uh, for the last uh, maybe 40 minutes, uh, we will try to see how we can use that uh, in a specific uh, physical applications. So for instance, let's consider uh, an equation, which is the, in this case, the Burger equation, which is a, maybe a famous equation in, in physics, but not for machine learning people. Uh, so you have a quantity of interest U, which is a, for instance, a velocity. Uh, so basically what we have is that we have a relationship between the temporal evolution of this quantity U, Uh, advection term, so it's a transport term here. So it's u times gradient of u. And here it's a diffusion term. Okay. So basically, if you start a simulation at t0, okay, the beginning of your simulation, so your input uh, spatial domain is x, u is here in the vertical axis, and the initial condition is the blue uh, curve, okay? If you apply uh, this simulation, well, this equation to this uh, input condition, what you will see is this. So if you end up your simulation like time equals one, you have this kind of shock, okay? So a, a strong, uh, strong difference between a very smooth function at the beginning, it's almost piecewise uh, linear, okay? So it's a very interesting because in this case, what we would like to do is, okay, we've done some regression on linear function or just a, a parabola and stuff like that. Can we do some regression on this kind of data? So for instance, uh, from a machine learning perspective, what we will do is that, okay, uh, maybe uh, I want to sample all the data, okay, run simulations and take some points. And I will apply my favorite neural network on that and try to uh, approximate this function. Okay. Uh, so that's really uh, a purely data-driven approach. We do not take care about the physical equation that leads to this simulation, okay? So the question is, uh, how can we uh, be more intelligent, let's say, and try to introduce some physics inside? Uh, so can we, for instance, uh, put this kind of information inside the regression problem. So we will have some data points, okay? We will do some regression, but is there a way to introduce this physical knowledge in the regression, okay? So that's the purpose of uh, the part now of the lecture. So this kind of technique is called physics-informed neural network. Basically, what we have in the input is X, the spatial domain, and T, the time. You have your network, which, try to, which tries to uh, approximate the velocity field U that you have in your uh, equation. Okay. And if you do just a regression like we did before, we just apply X and T, we get U, and we compute the loss and you try to minimize the loss, okay? But the question is, okay, we know that you should follow this equation, okay? So can we add some term in the loss function to force the velocity fields to follow this equation? 
So basically, what we can do is to take the output of your network. You compute some derivatives with respect to the time, to the spatial domain, or in the Laplacian. You get this. So this is the left term on the equation, and this is the right term. So if you add this minus the right term, it should be equal to zero. Okay. So a loss that we could introduce here is a second loss is I want my solution U, my estimated U, to follow this equation. So this quantity should be equal to zero. Okay. So you see that now your loss function is not only a typical regression uh, loss function. You have to introduce this physical knowledge from this PDE. Okay. Of course, you know that your data follow this PDE. Uh, and so basically, we will do that in the notebook. So the, the, the key thing here is that we use automatic differentiation for the loss in the regression setting, but we can also use that to introduce some physical knowledge in our network. Okay. So basically, and you will, uh, you will see this, I guess, with Roland, because it's an inverse problem. Uh, so you have a PDE for your velocity field uh, U, okay, which is a function of X and T. So the spatial domain and the temporal domain. So this is your equation. In our case, it, it's going to be the, the burger equation. Uh, what you want to, to say is that my solution U, given by the neural network, has to minimize this. So the residual, okay, which is the, the evolution of U, given uh, all the derivatives uh, with respect to X and second derivative and so on. So basically, what you can do very easily in a supervised setting, you consider the typical regression loss function as before, okay, which is the difference between your prediction and the true values, right? And you add the term, which is R, and R is this. So it's the residual of the predicted values, okay? Because you want that the output of your network uh, follows this equation, you want that the residual is equal to zero, or very low at least. So basically, what we will do now is a regression problem. Okay. And we will have to define two, two losses one which is a very uh, common, and one which is, uh, let's say, a physically informed. So uh, it comes from the PD uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that should be um, constrained, uh, that should constrain sorry, your solution. Just uh, maybe if, if we want to, uh, to introduce some, some vocabulary here uh, in machine learning or in inverse problem, and you, so you will see that also in future uh, lecture. The first term is called the fidelity, the data fidelity term. So you have some samples and you want that your solution are, is, you want to, that your solution is close to this uh, sample. And the other one is called the regularization term. So you want to obtain a specific solution of uh, you, okay? You don't want any kind of function because the, there are many, many solutions. You want a specific solution, and in this case, you add some physical term. Okay, so it's not the, the setting is not really complicated, and we will do that also in a notebook. So uh, this one is called Burgers 1D. So you can run that in, uh, in Google Collab once again to, to uh, simulate uh, the data 
we use a, a, a library called uh, FiFlow. Okay, so that's the first cell. You, uh, you install this, uh, this library. Uh, basically, what we do is that we need to uh, define, well, the size of the spatial domain, the number of temporal steps, and so on. So in this case, uh, the, the size of the spatial domain is 128, and the number of temporal steps is 32, okay? And we, we provide also the, the value of the viscosity new. Okay, so the first cell is just to use FiFlow to simulate some data. Okay, so we won't go too much into details in this. It's not really uh, the purpose here. So you try to simulate data. Question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question from Clément uh, is that, is, is it, uh, isn't it a little bit overkill if I know the equation for the data and uh, to learn what, from the data and from the equation? Uh, well, typically here, it's really a, 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 an example where you can use automatic differentiation to introduce that in the, the, the physical constraint, okay? Uh, it's a very toy example since we know exactly the equation in this case. Um, the purpose will be more uh, different if we don't have that much data, just for instance, the initial condition. Uh, and you want to propagate uh, the, the this initial solution uh, with, well, in this case, you know the equation, you are able to, to, uh, to have a numerical solver for that. Uh, but once again, it may not be uh, possible all the time. Uh, so in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's, you will see that um, it's more about a way to introduce some constraint uh, in your regression. Um, it's, it's really an example. Uh, okay, so the first cell is to uh, create some data. Uh, the second cell is to convert this data from the FiFlow uh, library to NumPy and to Torch. And uh, so we have here exactly uh, the simulation as before, okay? Is exactly it's exactly this. Uh, so it's a 1D display. Uh, it's not. It's very nice to see the shock here, but we, there is a, another way to look at the data. It's this way. So you have a 2D display here. So uh, the vertical axis is the spatial domain, and here is the time. So the, we we. I just dilate the time to, to look at the, at the data. So it's really a nearest neighbor interpolation. Um, so here you, you can see the, the, the initial condition, and then you can see the shock, which is really uh, clear at the end of the simulation. So it's another way to look at your data. Uh, so the first thing is to use supervised learning. Okay, so we just consider data points. And as uh, previously, we do uh, a very simple thing. We try to minimize uh, MSC loss uh, on the data points. So we define here um, a network. Uh, it's not gonna be a very complicated network. Basically it has four hidden layers uh, with 20 neurons. Uh, so it's exactly the same as uh, as you as you've seen uh, in previous uh, notebooks. We define the criterion and the optimizer. Okay, there is nothing really new here. And then it's exactly exactly the same code as you used for the previous notebook. Okay, so it's a loop over the iteration. You compute the prediction. You compute the loss. 
and you uh, update the parameters with respect to the gradient. We checked once again the loss function. Okay, it's decreasing, nice. And then we look at the results. Okay, so in this case, uh, I took the first time, so t is equal to zero. The simulation, so the data points, uh, the inputs, the true data points are the, the red one. And the fit, uh, the fit is the green, the green dots. So it's it it looks nice for T zero. It's not perfect, of course, but it's not so bad because the, the network is very very simple. And if you look at the shock, okay, you can see the, the kind of artifact you have in an approximation <laughs> problem, okay, because it's a very piecewise linear. Uh, um, function you try to to approximate. Um, so in this case, it's not perfect, but it's still not so bad. And what we can do is to compute uh, the error with respect to the simulation and also the mean absolute error. So here we can see that the absolute the mean absolute error is about zero point zero two two. Okay. When you look at the, the, the error, you can see that definitely the maximum error is at the shock. So at the last time and in the middle of the, the domain. Okay. Uh, that's, that's another plot where you can look at just the final uh, time of your simulation. Okay, so this, this is just a regression. So as previously, okay. Now a question is, if we try to subsample the data, in the simulation, we add like uh, 4,000 data points, okay? And because it's an approximation problem, what can be the result if you uh, reduce drastically the number of points? So the next step in the notebook, is a subsampling. And as you can see, we just keep 200 points. Okay. So it's very small compared to previous stuff. We use exactly the same network, the same parameterization. The loop is exactly the same. And now you can look at the results. It's very similar, it's not very good. And you can see that the mean absolute error is a little bit higher, it's 0 0.036. Okay. Of course, the purpose here is not to have a perfect fit. Okay, you can uh, increase the size of your network and so on. Uh, that's not really the purpose here. If you want to run that in collab, it should be fast today. So. Uh, you can play uh, after that by adding layers and stuff like that. But if you run already this, it's a 10,000 iteration, so epochs. So it's a little bit long. Uh, okay. So now, uh, as an in inverse problem, okay, you, you have the regression problem. We subsample the data, so we don't have many data. The question is, if we add this physically informed prior, what can be the results? Okay, how can we put this in the loss function? And what can be the result? Do we really improve the result? So this is where you will have to work. Uh, so the question is, how can you introduce the term R in your loss function? So basically, uh, you need to define this function, which is called uh, here the residual function. The input variables are u, x, and t. And you need to write it using the automatic differentiation. So we can use it as a loss function. Okay. 
and then to add this, you need to write the function R and then to add this in the in the loop, in the iteration loop. Uh, try to increase the size of that. So uh, basically, we use the autograd the grad function. Uh, U is not a scalar value, so you do you can use the same trick as before. You apply the sum on that. Uh, basically, to save memory uh, during the back propagation in PyTorch, uh, when you ask to to compute some gradient, uh, PyTorch will uh, delete the graph to save memory. And so, because we need to compute multiple gradients, we have to say, please keep the graph. So it's the function retain graph equals to true. Uh, so basically you apply a grad on u with respect to t, on u with respect to x, and then der derivative of u with respect to x, with respect to x. And you get this. So this is a, a function to compute the residual of your uh, of this uh, equation. Uh, as we seen before, uh, we need to to say that the input variables x and t will need to to be used during the the graph uh, the gradient. Uh, so we have to say it requires grad it is equal to true. Okay. Then we use exactly the same parameter parameterization of the, the network. Okay, same number of layers, same number of neurons, and so on. What is the difference in the in the loop? Uh, so we do the prediction. Uh, I just add a way to um, to balance the two terms. Okay, so the physical term is very small. The, I, I add a weight. Uh, dot zero zero one okay so you compute the uh, data fidelity uh, term to the loss which is the MSC, msc between the prediction and the true values you compute also the physical loss okay which is given by the residual function and i use in this case the mean absolute value here of r uh, you save these two losses and you apply once again, the back propagation. Okay, so I, I did that uh, in two steps. So I propagate uh, on the data loss. I say again, please keep the graph because I will need it after that. And you back, you do the back propagation with respect to the physical loss. And that's it. Okay. It's just a way to uh, to remove the, the graph at, at the end. Uh, if we look at the prediction, this is what we can get. Okay. What is interesting to see is that the quantitative value here for the mean absolute value is lower than in the previous case, but it's also lower than in the fully supervised uh, approach when we add all the data, okay? So introducing this physical knowledge leads to nice uh, shock estimation, okay? It's still not perfect, but it's clearly better than when you use all the data points, okay? Uh, you can look, of course, uh, at the errors and so on. So the, the thing to, to keep in mind here is that really we can use this kind of automatic differentiation in many ways. And it's not so complicated to apply, okay? It's just a few lines and we, what we have to take care about is the, the memory consumption, okay? Should we keep the graph or should we, uh, should, can we release the graph and so on, okay? And that's it. But it's a, near, a really nice uh, application where 
basically, if you add just a little bit of knowledge on your solution, it's, it's clearly better than a fully supervised approach on all the data. Okay. Um, just to, 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 to finish this, uh, when, we, when we talk about physics informed neural network, so PIN, uh, basically what we do is we add the physical knowledge as a soft constraint, okay? It's just a, an additional term in your loss function. You do not constrain uh, the solution to satisfy exactly this. What is nice is that automatic differentiation can be used to compute higher order derivatives. Okay, it's not so easy. But the problem is that it can be really memory expensive. And even in this uh, very small example, it can be really slow to add this in the training steps. Basically, this kind of approaches is an inverse problem where you try to add some physical knowledge in the regularization term. Okay. So now, just for the last five minutes, uh, there is another step where we can introduce more uh, physical knowledge, and it's called differentiable physics. Uh, basically, uh, Okay, if you consider, uh, like previously, a quantity of interest U, it can be a velocity field, for instance, and you have, and you have sorry, a, a physical equation, so a continuous formulation, it's called here P. Okay. Uh, usually, in numerical solver, maybe you can split this physical formulation into small parts. And if you can assume that you have this, so P can be also a composition of small functions, okay? Uh, we can directly implement this P, this small function. So the problem is then try to find U that minimizes the loss given hard physical constraint because you will force to follow the equation using P, okay? So basically what you do is you have your data, your input data, you provide, for instance, a, an estimate of the initial condition using a neural network. And then, so in this sense, you can have a first estimate. And then instead of doing this, you force, uh, from the initial condition, you force to follow exactly the physical equation. So you can use this. Of course, you need some knowledge about that. How can we do that? And, and so on and so on. So of course, we won't do that now. But if you know this, you can really add out constraint in your problem. So uh, basically, for instance, uh, uh, a short example, if you consider this model, which is a, a simplest, a sim simplest, yes, the simplest one. Um, assume that you have this evolution equation, so you are able to, to compute the evolution of this quantity D, for instance, it can be a density, okay? It depends on the, the following equation, okay? Now the problem is to find U, that given an initial state, initial state D zero, to, to, to go to a target density uh, at the final time, which means that if you think about Berger's equation, you try to find the first initial condition, which was the cosine or the sine, okay? that will provide the shock we've seen. And because you follow exactly the physical equation, you are just looking at the initial condition, okay? So the question when, using, when you use this kind of approaches is that what is the uh, initial condition that will provide this final state? So this is it. You know the final state, okay? At the end of your simulation, 
and you want to apply uh, exactly this physical equation. And you can, of course, use automatic differentiation here to, uh, to find you. OK, uh, of course, we won't have time to go into a notebook for this. Uh, if you want to go uh, deeper on that in the five flow um, website, uh, there is a notebook explaining this. But basically, what is done is this. It's a loop over the iteration. Here is just five. OK, and instead of, um, of predict of the prediction of, uh, of new values using the neural network, what you do is you apply a simulation given an initial condition, okay? So this is really the simulation engine. And then you compute the loss between what you have simulated from the initial guess and your solution. And then you apply your gradients on the initial condition, okay? So it's really the same approach, but in this case, you have a, a really hard constraint and you update your final, uh, your initial condition using the gradient. And this is what you can get on Burger. So if you, you want, uh, I invite you to look at the notebook and basically you can recover the shock uh, nicely. And what is interesting in this case is that it's just using 50 iterations. And previously, we used thousands of iterations. So that's that's the strength here: is that because you introduce hard, really hard constraint on the physical knowledge, you need less uh, step to uh, to uh, to get the final uh, result. Um, so, just to to think about this with respect to the previous one, uh, you you need more knowledge about, of course, your physical equations and the numerical methods behind this, uh, you are able to compute the derivatives, again, using automatic differentiation. And the thing is this, the, maybe the implementation is a little bit more complicated because you have to, to put the simulating part inside the loop, okay? So it's just, uh, just to, to, to know that it can exist. Okay. Uh, so to conclude and to look at all the points we've discussed, there is a question. For you. Uh, there is a question. But finding a minimum is a difficult problem. No, does it mean that each stake takes more time? Uh, finding a minimum is a problem, and you will see that with Luca and Serge. <laughs> more the, op the optimization part. Uh, it means that each step takes more time, yes, because you need to introduce the simulation step inside the loop. You are not just applying your uh, network, you have to simulate again and again. So that's why each iteration is longer, but you do less iterations. Okay, so to, uh, to sum up uh, this, uh, this lecture, uh, when we look at machine learning, it's really data-driven approaches. Okay, we've seen that with the regression problem. You just look at the data and try to fit something, a function on your data. The key thing on neural network to know is that it's really popular because of this, because it's a composition of function. So you have really to keep in mind that what we are doing in regression, for instance, it's just an approximation problem. And we split it in a very small uh, function. Automatic differentiation, of course, is a very powerful tool to compute the gradients. It's not only for deep learning. You can use that everywhere. Uh, supervised learning for regression, it's basically interpolation, meaning that on unseen data, don't get any, well, don't expect any good result. And the tool I think, things, sorry, a way to introduce some physical term is just to modify the loss. So you just, you can keep really the ne neural network architecture you have and you just modify the loss. And the last is really, uh, and we'll see, you will see this uh, with Ronan also, is really try to make things together, try to intricate the way you use uh, deep networks and 
physical equations, so numerical solvers and so on and so on. And so to finish, if you want to, uh, to, have, to look at, at uh, some references, the first, the, all these are uh, freely available on the, on the web. The first one is really a, a basic book on deep learning. The second one is a new one. It's, it's a really nice. It's, uh, it covers a lot of uh, deep learning um, things with notebook and with notebooks in TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on. And you have many, many, many uh, resources in that. And the last one is related to what we've seen in the burgers uh, notebook. It's uh, the link between deep learning and uh, physics. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No? Good. <laughs>